Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop. And uh, we've got a great guest tonight. Like, wait, when do we not have a great guest? This guy I particularly like because he's a great guy. George Washington III is our guest today. Say hi, George. Hello, everybody. There we Hello, go. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Oh, you meant the other guy, uh, the other George, sorry. Yeah, the other George. It's going to be confusing for the next hour, so stay and pay I'm really tech. tight attention. Got it. Got it. Okay? I'm the third. Just call me the tech. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All this, if you've got a question for George or for George or for me, you know, I said, so it's going to be GW3 and, and the other guy. <laughs> and now stop that. <laughs> it's, time, it's time for voiceover body shop right now. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source Elements, the folks who bring you Source Connect, JNC Demos, when quality matters. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voice actor website shouldn't be a pain in the butt. VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for voiceover success. And by World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. Pump up your gain just a little bit there, George. I need more gain all of a sudden? You need more gain, and I neither need less. Or I, I'm, I guess I've been just, I was excited, and now I'm like settled in, and now I'm, I'm sort of calm again. So there you go. There's right. three more dB coming at you. All right. And now we sound a little bit more even. All right. Okay. So, anyhow, fascinating. I was at a concert the other day at uh, the Skirbel, if you've ever been over there. I and still haven't been there. Oh. Is it a nice venue? Oh, it's a beautiful venue, but I'm, we're sitting in the back row and everything sounded muffled. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about it and I started cupping my ears and I'm like, I'm hearing the mix better now. Then I stood up and I heard the mix a little bit better then. Uh -huh. And then I turned to my front Marcy and I'm like, you know, we were in the back row. I said, let's go stand in front of the sound guy. And suddenly there was this magnificent sound because the speakers were too low. It was muffling everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, if they raised them up five feet, it would have sounded fantastic. The state of the art now is that they're all hung, and they have like this thing called a line array, right? Right. So whenever you go to the Hollywood Bowl or this big, even in smaller venues, they will still even just hang two or three of those speakers because they don't need to throw as far. But right. that's the state of the art nowadays, and it really it, it improves the clarity in the back of the room. Yeah. See, now that was going on, and I'm thinking, oh, George would be throwing up by now. <laughs> 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 Being picky about audio definitely makes going to live sound live things harder, but the bar is being raised all the time. I, we went to see a live, not live, we went to see Inside Out, Pixar yeah. movie, mm -hmm. being screened in a parking lot by UCLA for all, anybody that signed up online could get in. And um, it was a full 7-1 surround playback in a parking lot. And it was impressive. <laughs> like it was, Oh yeah. you really got the full effect. I mean, I was, I was like not expecting that in a parking lot, you know, I was just expecting like stereo with some subwoofers. That would be fine. But <laughs> it was, it was rather, rather impressive and a lot of fun. This, yeah. Especially because our, our pal Lori Allen is in that movie. Oh, out, outstanding. Yeah. So anyhow, speaking of outstanding, we have an outstanding guest tonight. Uh, if, if you're interested in hearing about you know, how to make your career different. And that's what we're all about here is helping your voiceover career. You know, we talk about the tech, but we have all these great guests who talk about how it is they got where they are and every story is different. And then there's some stories that are kind of unique, but let me introduce our guest. Uh, George Washington, the third, uh, has a voice that stops listeners in their tracks and makes them pay attention. George is a full-time political voice actor. Why did I write political? Well, he does political stuff, but he's been a voice actor for over 17 years, uh, and helping clients communicate their stories. 
His voiceover work extends to radio and television, commercials, e-learning, corporate narration, and telephony. Or telephony, depending on how you say that. Uh, <laughs> and he provides solutions for clients all over the U.S. and all over the world. Let's welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop, George Washington III. Good afternoon slash evening, gentlemen. Hey, good, good to see you. We'll just refer to you as GW3. Because hey, when we that, email, that's, that's what I call pretty you. common. That's pretty common. <laughs> okay, I, 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 so I'm not being original or anything. <laughs> oh no, see, you know, I you know worked in restaurants and stuff where they'd call me Jorjito. Let's see, G Dub Trey. Yes, I was. Uh, my family called me Little George because I my dad. You know, so yeah, just whatever we works. Had the, I had the same problem in my family. I, I, I was the Little George as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was just known as, hey, you. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but anyway, you're like me. You're involved in all sorts of things, and you know, including uh, world voices, uh, voiceover, education, opera. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your background and how you arrived at all of these things. Yeah, what came first, opera or, or voice acting? Yeah. Um, opera did. So first, uh, my background when I was in college, I was a vocal performance major for a while. <laughs> I ended up with a Bachelor of Arts in music. And then I went into the, what do I do with this? And I went into IT. And so I worked on PCs, installing PCs, fixing computers, fixing software, supporting users. And uh, I started working for First Union National Bank in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1998. And during that work, somebody, I, I got on an elevator with a woman named Elizabeth Taylor. So George Washington III and Elizabeth Taylor were on an elevator together. <laughs> Sounds like a setup for a joke. Yeah, for sure. yeah absolutely Where is this does. going? <laughs> well, and she asked me, hey, do you want to be the on-camera host for a couple of internal videos? And I said, sure, why not? And so I started doing that. Uh, in addition to my uh, IT work. And in one of those instances, I had to go to a local studio and record the voiceover for what we were doing. And walking around this studio, it was just the people uh, were so nice. And this is, you know, they had some voiceover work things going on. And I said, hey, um, what would I need to do if I wanted to do voiceover? And they said, well, you know, bring us scripts. We'll help you make your demos and uh, we'll go from there. And it was, uh, you know, you know how demos cost these days. It was $350. Wow. Um, so I went off for six months and practiced and w did the thing that I never tell, I tell no one ever to do again. <laughs> I did it without coaching. I went back and I made a narration demo and a commercial demo and then started getting it around. And that was about 2003 or so. Uh, and so... Yeah, so I've continued on working in IT and working in things and and doing voiceover on the side and uh, eventually was able to move to the point where I said, you know what, this is what I do in its entirety. Um, as an opera singer, so I started singing with Opera Carolina in Charlotte in 1998. And I was I, I mostly in the chorus, but I did have small roles. And when we do the really small things like Amal and the Night Visitors, I was one of the kings and, and things like that. And uh, one of the nice things is like, hey, could you uh, come do our phone messages for us? So I do the phone messages for the opera company. <laughs> and I do the in-house in announcement basically to say, here is our primary sponsor and... Uh, you know, don't use flash photography. So, um, so you even when I yes. sing, yeah, yeah, guess, exactly. You just kept saying yes. Yeah. I guess <laughs> if you that, need, yeah. if you're going to pay me to do something, you know, that is using my voice generally, I'm going to say yes. Uh -huh. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I kept doing that and, and continued to do voiceover and keep trying to grow what I do. Um, my goal was to make my living with my voice and that's where we've gone. And, Things have reached the point where that's what I can actually do. Uh, that's great. Um, once again, our guest is George Washington III. As the discussion goes on, if you have a question for him, throw it in the chat room, whether you're on Facebook uh, Live or whether you're on YouTube or wherever you might be watching this. Uh, but 
you can ask him a question. We will get to that in our next segment, because I know Jeff Holman is in there with his feathered quill writing down these questions and then you know holding them up to us and so we can see what those questions are that's, that's some 21st century tech right there it, right? it is we you know we the feathered we, quill yes <laughs> well it's only doing it for you george washington forsooth uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway now now you do it all you do commercials including political spots e-learning corporate narration with so much competition out there now, and you've been doing, you know, you've been doing it online for what, about 20 years now? Mm hmm. You know, when we first started 20 years ago, it was like, okay, it, it was kind of easy pickings for, for a lot of work. Now it's, it's a totally different marketplace. How have you been able to differentiate yourself? What is, I like to say, what's your competitive point of difference that, um, you know, that getting people's attention? Yeah, I I like to say that um, my competitive advantage is my versatility, and I am I will do pretty much whatever kind of work there is. I don't do audiobooks just from a timing perspective, and I know that that is an entirely different work world than than I'm used to doing. And I've done a handful. I've just decided that's not where I want to be um, professionally. But I like to I play up my versatility. I speak about my background as having an artistic background beyond just being a voice actor and I make it really easy to work with me. Right. And so I, I want people to know that if you're going to ask me for this thing, I will have it back in time. I will have it back so that you can make changes. I will make it. If you want to be here while I do it, you can be here while I do it. I've actually, you know, most of the time we're doing, you know, doing it remotely, whether that's zoom or whatever, but, uh, Earlier this year, I did a narration for talking about the Rosenwald schools in the Southeast. And the Rosenwald schools were schools that were built throughout the Southeast with support from uh, the then president of Sears Roebuck. Because at that time, those school, schools for African-American students were not being supported by the local governments. And Julius Rosenwald put money aside and had people contribute and build these schools. So when they asked me to do the narration, uh, I was like, sure. And the person who was there said, can we come and listen? And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and you know, this is not like, I don't have a huge studio set up or anything. So they sat on the couch, the gentleman and his wife sat on the couch and I turned on the monitors and I did what I needed to do. And the next time he's like, I've heard it. You're fine. I can do it over, you know, Google meet next time. Um, I also like when I say I'll do whatever they ask for the second version of that for South Carolina, they said, can you do on camera for us? And I'm, you know, on camera is not a problem for me. So I drove down to Newberry, South Carolina, and I did the walk up and sp spoke the lines off teleprompter, gestured to the place. And then the next week we came back and did the actual narration. So I try to give them all the options and let them know what I'm fully capable of singing everything. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you do your marketing? I, I, I'm going to assume you have several different tools in your toolkit. Well, I, I will admit I'm not the greatest at marketing that, that I'm not, I, I, have done less of it than I would intend to, but most of that's because getting ramped up and getting into doing things fully. Right. Um, but I have been poke, poking my toe into the LinkedIn process and doing those things and making and using LinkedIn as a process. I am pretty active on social media, but I don't point at the social media to make it say, okay, I do voiceover, please hire me. Cause that doesn't really tend to have a ton of get back. Most of it is just a established that I am a known quantity, <laughs> help the SEO show people that the, what I'm capable of. I mean, the stuff that I'm doing right now, you know, I read poems, right? I do, you know, I do poetry where, um, I read it. I say it's, uh, the hashtag is one minute of poetry. And I do a, if the poem is sometimes it's over a minute, but both times it's a minute or less. I will do a reading and I will post it. And I just point out, here's something that I can do. And I hashtag it with voiceover as well. And so it's more of a, hey, I have these other gears too. 
and make people understand that, yes, if you need a B to do hard sell, I can do that. I can do the sports sell. But this kind of read where I'm making something into a conversation based on, you know, on this poetic lines, those things work too. So I do have things like I use close as my CRM, which lets you do some real organized, send the emails out and makes it a little easier it can interface with MailChimp and I'm working through how to make that happen with what I do. Um, I have done some cold calling, but cold calling isn't my favorite. Like there are some people who are great at it. It's not mm. my best thing. Yeah, that's, um, that's a tough one for a lot of people is cold calling. Yeah. It's like, it, yeah. That's, that's just sales 101. Yeah. Exactly. But you know, part of what I, the way I look at it for most people, especially when people are starting out, I'm saying, Make sure you know who the recording studios in your local area are. Find out who they are and if they have a, a roster, then go talk to them. Go talk to them. Don't, you know, don't reach out to them personally. Go speak to them and see what you can do for them. I have, I have clients here in town where they, you know, they don't audition me anymore. They, you know, for a lot of things, they do send auditions, but many times they're like, hey, we have this thing for you. Can you come in and do it? You know, and that way they are, you know, I, they are a part of my normal, here are the people I can count on. Right. So, yeah. That seems like a, a sign in, in a career that, that's spanned some time where you, when you get to that point where you, you can fill in a lot of your day with just reliable client content that they just keep coming back to you and you don't feel like you're in a constant state of, got to hustle for the next gig, got to hustle for the next gig. That's got to be a good feeling. It is. And you know, that doesn't mean that I don't hustle for it. Obviously I get my auditions and I try and get them in and make sure yeah. everything's done when necessary, but it does help to know that here's a level that I know is going to be here. And then I continue to work on the rest of it to try and grow that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not being greedy, just trying to make a living. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, yeah, you're just trying to make a living. That's the most important part. Uh, once again, we're talking with George Washington III. If you have a question uh, with him or for him or about him, throw it in the chat room. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Um, so when, once you get a client, it's important to make them a client. And, you, and you've, dis you've discussed the ways that you do that, that you know, once you mm -hmm. land a gig, um, you know, you, you make them a client for life by making their life easier. And that's, that's clearly mm -hmm. what you're saying. How, how do you, but how have you been getting most of your work? How did you get the initial work? So initially it was through production houses, um, before I decided, before I made an effort to reach out to, um, to agents. And, um, so I worked with production houses and got their, got work through them built up basically a book of business saying, here's what I'm capable of and here's what I've done, then reached out to agents. And I have multiple agents at this point. Um, my, I have representation across the country, though I'm not specifically represented in the giant markets. That's kind of the next move from a, from a representation standpoint. Right. But I, I have a lot of, I have, I have a lot of people who are doing, you know, that I get work from. And again, you know, I don't win them all. No one does. You know, I try and remind those people who are starting out, you're going to win one to 2% of them. That's the way it works. And so you have to make sure that you are getting work from enough people that that one or 2% isn't going to kill you by not having it available to you. That's just the way this work is. It is acting. It is people trying to, you're competing with a ton of people. And I know a lot of us say we're not competing. Yeah. We're not strictly saying you or me. It is that in the end, but that's not how we have to function. Right. Right. I look at it as I have always told people, this is not a rejection business. It's a selection business. And most of the time you're not going to get selected. You have to keep building it up so that more people do select you. And once they select you, they decide to come back to you over and over again. And that right. means being available that means being easy to work with. Consistent. Yeah. yeah. And every, every single time. Now, what, what, when, when you and I first met, that's a good 10 years ago, I think, probably at FAFCON. And I yep. found out you, you were an opera singer. 
uh, you know, and usually we'll get into talking about operas, <laughs> mm-hmm. one particular opera or another. I've, I've done a little bit of Gilbert and Sullivan and stuff. But have mm-hmm. you found that opera singing really helped your career? I mean, that, that is, is, is there something in, in, in singing and, in, you know, in a very formal way like that that helped you understand how to, you know, obviously how to use your voice? But it's projecting is not really what they want anymore. And opera is definitely projecting because you're not mic'd or anything. Right. Exactly. You know, that is the thing is you're not necessarily using that particular skill, that projection. You have electronics. That's not the job. That's not the job anymore. But you do learn how to breathe. And it is such a core need for what we do. Being able to to diaphragmatically breathe and not make it a big deal. Right. That is a that is a skill that most people simply don't have when they come into it. And there's not a reason for them to have it, right? Unless they've been in a situation where projection is what they have to do. But then you have to work off the other parts of that projection, right? Stage actors who project, you're like, okay, remember, this room is a whole lot smaller. That's not where you're trying to go. You're not trying to push to the back of the back of the room anymore. So I think opera helped in one, getting your breathing right. And you do have some acting that goes along with it, but you got to tamp it back a little bit because it is awfully large, right? You don't do small things on an opera stage. (laughs) You're going to be big, right? Right. And so learning how to, to take emotion from something like music and then transfer that to the people who are watching you're still doing that but you're now you're just doing it by doing it in speech um on a more kind of blatant space about how opera helps i do get singing jobs now and again uh where there's where you'll see auditions that say we need an operatic sound I'm like, hey i'm ready <laughs> <There you> um <laughs> i think my favorite one for that so far has been one i did for fruit by the foot and the audition <laughs> came in and they said, and they just said, Hey, how long can you hold a note? And I said, how long do you need me to hold it? <laughs> right, right. And, and, uh, they said, well, send us an audition and just hold it as long as you can. And I sent it and they said, well, we don't need, <laughs> that's what I've got then. So I ended up right. just saying fruit by the foot for about eight or nine seconds just hold it as long as they need it give it long enough so that they could use a fade that was they didn't the whole believe point they didn't believe you could <laughs> right. hold it for a minute right. or something. exactly <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you know there are everyone you know and just because that kind of jingle that kind of singing isn't as important you know don't see that in commercial as much but i think two weeks ago i did another one that was just a you know just three notes you know for this thing same right. kind of idea but i have that gear if somebody needs it right right so yeah. um, that's what now it's why all about I point short, out that little short sound bites, right? Exactly. My jingle, my jingle might be three notes. Exactly, and having that, and that can be any singer, right? I mean, if you right. if you know how to sing and you can get those three notes, you're in good shape. Um, I like because it is a particular style, and people know what when people do that. There's a, you know, it's usually in terms of uh, it's going to be a parody. It's meant to be funny. Then I got that, you know. I don't. I don't need to do the entire Toreador song for anybody <laughs> just for <laughs> mm-hmm. their, for a commercial. So, right. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people, especially when they're beginning, you know, and I, and I, and George and I get a lot of audio from people. One of the things we notice is people breathing in the middle of sentences, uh, which, you know, drives me nuts. It's like, if you can't read an entire sentence without taking a breath, you, you, you got a problem, you know? I mean, there are people out there that, you know, you, that we probably all know. It's like they will talk and talk and talk and you'll go, take a breath, take a breath. <laughs> just, just shut up for a second. Um, but it, it, practicing, as you were saying, diaphragmatic breathing, it's really important to be able to read one or even two sentences without taking a breath. And which, you know, saves an awful lot of time with editing and stuff like that. It does. And, but I think what happens for a lot of people is you're, if you're not prepping, if you're not, and that doesn't mean you necessarily have to go and go line by line and look at every line and do all those things, but you got to get your eyes ahead of the text enough to know that 
I'm not going to have, you know, I have all of this text to say. So I need to get a good breath when I start. I need that two seconds or three seconds of diaphragmatic breathing before I get into this so I can do those first two sentences before I actually need a breath. And recognize that you can take those things out, right? You don't, have, you know, it's, it's not necessary to, to get to the point where you're like, right. When you've read all the way to the end of your breathing, I, you I've heard it though. That. <laughs> yeah. I've heard it too. And, and, you know, I, I try not to let that become a habit with me because every once in a while you're like, you're going and you're in a flow and you're like, okay, stop, go back to the beginning of that paragraph and start that again with a good breath. So it doesn't feel like you're running out by the time you get to the end, yeah. you know, that happens in not just audiobooks, you know, long form narration and e learning and that sort of thing. When you run into people who don't write to be spoken and they're ra- writing to be read, you know, yeah, um, exactly. I actually write back to people when I get copy and it's clear that they wrote it for me to read out loud. I'm like, thank you so much for being considerate of how this actually works. Absolutely. Once again, we're talking with George Washington the third. Uh, we're talking about his voiceover career and some of the cool stuff. Is uh, If you've got a question, again, throw it in the chat room, whether you're on Facebook Live or whether you're on YouTube Live, uh, and we will get that question to him in just a couple of minutes. Now, one of the areas that you've been active in in the last few years is the subject of diversity in media. Uh, can you tell us what you think about the current state of affairs and how you think it can be changed and really what... What brought your attention to this? Well, um, clearly, as a person of color, there's always an interest in what diversity is and and how we can be a part of what's going on. And there is, and this is just reality, there has up to this point been a baseline acceptance that the default voice is a white male voice. And that has been the way it works, unless it was advertising that was focused directly at a, you know, the black community or a Hispanic community. And that would be the only kind of voice that you could use unless you're really speaking to that area. But in the last few years, we've seen the growth of the use of different kinds of voices that are considered for general consumption, right? And that is a good thing. It's, it's good to grow. It's going to be happening more and more. It's not just a matter of ethnicity anymore, as I'm sure people have seen non-binary postings, you know, and I know that some people say, well, what does that even mean? That is up to the listener and up to the people who are doing the casting to say, does that sound like a non-binary voice? But I think that's all to the good. We are getting better at this. I think the industry is getting better at it, of recognizing that we need to hear the speech of more than one kind of person if you're reaching out to advertise, influence, get people to to do what you would like. More people who can hear it in a voice that sounds familiar to them will be more beneficial to your message. And that's I think that has been a a a a point that we have gotten better and better and we can continue to improve as that happens. You know, we've seen this with female voices in spaces that we traditionally didn't hear them in sports, in automotive, that is starting to happen. That's a good thing to make sure that people, that that representation is happening across the board. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Once again, if you got a question for George about any one of these topics, throw it in the chat room and we will get to that in just a second. Um, you and I are working on a project together, um, because we haven't (laughs) been able to do this in a couple of years. Uh, we both serve on the, the board of world voices. And one of the things that we've wanted to do is get our annual conference back together. And we've not been able to do it obviously because of the pandemic, but we got one planned for Orlando, uh, next May. So it's less than a year. And you're in charge of this. <laughs> I'm, I'm standing back waiting for whatever it is you need me to do. <laughs> what, tell us a little bit more about what, what we're thinking about here. So WovoCon, as you mentioned, is, uh, is an important part of the World Voices community in that 
this group of people uh, should be organized around one of the main principles that we have for the organization, which is members helping members. And part of that commitment to members helping members should be face-to-face, meeting the people that were also in the organization, sharing of knowledge so that people all understand that their needs can also be met by other people in the industry who have similar experience. Not everyone has all the answers, but everyone has some answers. And we want to make sure that that is part of what we offer as an organization. And WovoCon, like many conferences, disappeared for a, for a while due to the pandemic. You know, I have specific experience with the whole pandemic and what kind of impact it can have on a life. And I, we did what was necessary. And we also had run into a situation where we had done it for seven years or six years and we had kind of tapped out on the people who were, who had been organizing and it's, it's hard work. And we looked at it this year and said, we need to bring this back as a part of what we do to be of value to our members. And we want people to be able to come there, share their knowledge, get new knowledge, and be reminded that they are not alone. Because what we do is such an isolating business um, in that we are working in boxes like these for long periods of time. And it's nice to be able to have those moments to talk with people and, and know that there is a shared community there. Now, we are different from the other conferences in that this is not one, it's not a money making venture for us, and it is specifically for our membership. And so we like to think that that sets us apart from the others. Not that anyone is any worse or better, but this is for us. And I, I believe that that's a positive thing that we can offer to our membership. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to. We're going to start to take a break here in just a, just a second, but uh, George, great having you with us. And again, if anybody has a question for him about any of the stuff that we're talking about, throw it in the chat room because we love hearing from you and knowing that you're out there and watching our show and uh, paying attention to what's going on out in the voiceover world. And George is one of those guys that's like really in there, in the trenches, doing what it takes. Anyway, we're going to take a break and we'll be right back with George Washington III right after these important messages. Don't go away. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voice of Our Body Shop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. Oh, it's you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. Inflated prices? Not at voiceoveressentials.com. Despite the nationwide inflation rate of over 8%, VoiceOver Essentials refuses to raise prices. In fact, they refuse to even say the I-word. Their inventory is large on all their products, and they purchase them before the current economic conditions. It's simply wrong to increase profit, as many retailers are doing right now. So Harlan and company promise not to raise their prices during difficult times for everyone. They'll stay the course, steady and sure, flat and firm, solid and steadfast. Okay, enough. You get the point. Unfortunately, they're under the same inflationary pressures as everyone else and they'll need to restock in the not-so-distant future. No doubt, they'll be sticker shock for them and you. So, right now is the time to order that Portabooth Pro or VO1A voiceover microphone and their VO2.0 headphones. Fight inflation at voiceoveressentials.com. 
Hey there, it's David H. Lawrence the 17th. I teach a curriculum called VO Heroes Pro, uh, close to 40 classes on voiceover, performance, the business, the technology, the mindset. And with all those courses, I'm sure there are still things that I don't teach. And I'd love to know, if you wouldn't mind helping me out, what you'd like to learn. Is there something that has always puzzled you about our business or something you just don't know about or something that you you wish you had a better take on? Go to voheroes.com slash survey. There's a one question survey waiting for you. And that is, what would you like to know? I'd love to teach it. So voheroes.com slash survey. That's voheroes.com slash survey. Let me know what I can teach you. And I thank you. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem, VOBS.TV. And we are back with George Washington III here on Voice Over Body Shop. Again, if you've got a question for him, throw it in the chat room. Plenty of time to uh, to do that as well. Uh, let's see here. we we got one question here starting off from Terry Briscoe. Uh, he says, I've done six different categories of voiceover in my first year. Everyone says that you should focus on an area that you're starting out. As you just said, you're someone who's known for their versatility. Do you subscribe to that philosophy? Why or why not? Clearly you've spread yourself out in a lot of places. Um, uh, so Terry, what I, the way I look at it is do all kinds of stuff when you're starting out. So that if you decide I'm going to focus on one, you know, which one of those things you can focus on because you are going to have to find out if some of those things are things you like or not, right? If you start out right now, for instance, and say, well, I'm going to focus on audiobooks. Well, that's great. You better like audiobooks. <laughs> right? Um, I, my take on it has always been do all the things until there's a reason to do only one of the things. It gives me the opportunity to try a lot of different things, to do different kinds of genres, to do different kinds of characters and all that. And it leaves me less vulnerable to when I lose, you lose a thing and then everything else collapses around it. So it's, uh, I, I say, try a lot of things, uh, do a lot of different kinds of things. Um, some people will say that's not the right, right direction. It's worked for me. Right. And that's, that's really what counts. I know a lot of times when I'm talking to people, when they're just starting out, my question to them is, what's your superpower? You know, what is it that you do professionally now or are escaping from? Because I've, I've met a lot of, you know, recuperating chiropractors and podiatrists. And, and IT people. And IT people <laughs> <laughs> who are, you know, if, if you have knowledge of that area, I mean, when you started doing voiceover, it was because you were in the business that needed you to do that. And, you know, but if somebody's an expert in IT or military intelligence, I've heard that one, or was a priest or something along those lines, it's amazing where the opportunities are if you have that knowledge and that network to work with. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that I say to people starting out is, once you have professional demos, tell everyone you know, everyone. Things will come from the most random places. I will give you a, a, a strange example. So when I started out in Charlotte, I was also doing on-camera work. I was doing some on-camera commercials and all that while being in IT too. So that didn't work out so much. But I had an agent here in town. Her... I have, since we are no longer working together as agent and client, we're still in contact. I have sung at her mother's, sister's, and unfortunately her husband's funerals. But when I sang at the last one, that was where I met the gentleman who had me do this most recent series of documentaries. Because they they said they we, they heard me sing. We did the work, you know. We talked real briefly. They reached out to me later and said, "We think you're the right person to do these documentaries." Tell everyone. Tell them all the time. And m one of the things I also say is, don't ever tell them you're aspiring. You <laughs> are a voice actor. 
<laughs> right. you, are, you are a professional. Yep. Once you have no. professional, real demos, you are a voice actor. Don't give them a reason to think, well, you're just new into this and starting on. This is what you do. George, you got a question there? Yeah, I wanted to know more about the tech in your studio. What are the tools that you like to use? We obviously see your mic, but there's some more, mm-hmm. something going on on that mic arm I wanted to talk yeah. about. And then just tell us about the rest of your. All the things we can't see yeah. in your frame. So I have a this uh, this Neumann TLM one hundred three here. I also have, and I'll swing it into the camera a little bit here. I also have this shotgun mic, this uh, uh, the uh, Sennheiser four sixteen, and as you noted, I have them on this swing arm here in this uh, Studio Bricks booth. Um, my interface is an Apollo Twin Duo, a Mark II. Um, my Mac, my M1 Mac Mini is sitting outside, and so it is doing. It runs everything else in here, and uh, I have another monitor sitting outside. So I have two monitors to work on, and if I'm going to do any kind of editing, because occasionally I make sh- videos and whatnot, and I run Premiere out there, so I can edit on a larger screen, on a 35 inch screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, this uh, the stu- this is the Studio Bricks uh, VO edition. Um, I put a keyboard tray in here so that I can just sit here and type as well. And yep. uh, yeah, so that is in general, that's my basic setup. Got it. Do you have a, um, do you have a mirrored setup where like the monitor inside the booth is an identical mirror of what's outside the booth? Is that how you run it? Actually, this is like, I, I run my, I run my DAW and my scripts are happening here and out there is a secondary, it is a different display entirely. Oh, so okay. I drag things back and forth. Like if I go out there to work, I just drag the windows over to that side and I work Got on it. that screen. Cool. Cool. So, and I use as a DAW, I use audition. Adobe audition. Good Do you boy. find that with the Apollo? I mean, we, we've talked about the Apollo many times and we have our pros and cons about it, but. Do you, do you really feel like you take advantage of the tools that are in, that the, Provali, the Apollo provides? Or do you feel like you just use it on a more basic level that, you know, doesn't differentiate so, it that much from other interfaces? I'm going to pump you up here because <laughs> that, <laughs> that was why I intention. signed up. That I know that's not the intention, but I'm going <laughs> to say it anyway. That is why I signed up for your webinar because I do feel like right now I'm not using it to its fullest extent. Um, I need, I, one of the reasons, like I need to understand, um, I want to understand the virtual inputs better. I wanted to understand how it works and what I can do differently. I mean, honestly, one of the things I enjoy the most about having it here is, is it's right here on hand and I can make some, make your quick adjustments right there. I had a full mixer before, but it couldn't sit here close at hand and I had to reach under to do stuff. So this made yeah. that easier. And I did sign up for your webinar because I want to know more about how to use it better. I do have that thing working on. Now, I use a couple of, you know, like I use loopback for, for, you know, routing so that I can move things from one to the other. Like if I'm doing playback for somebody, it makes it easy to go right into the playback and all that. But yeah. I want to know more about my interface. And I think it's important for voice actors to know those things. They don't have to be you, obviously. But they should know more about the things they're doing, not necessarily because they're going to offer all of these grand things. Like most of us don't have to do full production. We're delivering yeah. dry lines. But it's a good idea to know what it's capable of. For instance, like in audition, most of us will never use or very rarely use multitrack. But occasionally, you might have to listen to some music while you do your record. And mm-hmm. know how that works. And you can just put that in multi-track and hit record and record against what's happening there. And then just, you know, send out, mix down just your lines and there you go. Yeah. And you can have video too. You can drag a video right into and have the video on screen and work with Exactly. Pictures, so so yeah. you need to know a little. You need to know enough to be dangerous, I guess is the best way to put it. <laughs> and that's why I want to know more about that interface because... I want to know how the what's the best way for me to use it, especially since I have two microphones connected to those outputs. What's the easiest way to switch back and forth? Because Audition looks at that piece of hardware, you know, <laughs> instead of those inputs per se. So right. being better about doing that, I think it's important to know all that. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what do you, why would you use the 102 or the 103 versus 
the 416. Mm, well, some of it is because I've done video games, right? And they don't generally don't want the uh, they don't want the uh, 416 uh, for mixing purposes. Or at least that's what they say. Now, you and I both know that some of the reasons they say that is gate is gatekeeping. Right. It's because they're saying, hey, we only want this kind of microphone. And they'll say it's a, a 103 or a U87. And I'm like, yeah, most of us are not having U87s hanging around in our studio. Right. But um, I like like last year I did a I did a few video games and I do a lot of stuff where I'm the 416 is like my home base. And I personally wanted to say, you're not going to tell me the reason I didn't get hired is because I didn't have. This available to me, right? <laughs> right <exactly. laughs> and so, if it is because if it's if I didn't do what I needed to do, that's fine. But it's not going to be because I didn't have the equipment for what was necessary. Yeah, I I don't think I've ever heard of somebody not getting the job because they say, "Well, I've got this type of microphone." Mm-hmm. If you if you if you sound good, well, as we like to say in the show, you are good. Um, and so, it's not really the microphone. But there is a distinct difference between the 103 and the 416. I mean, yes, the, you know, one is one is they, they both work differently at different proximities and stuff like that. Uh, but the you know clearly the 103 is a lot mellower for you know a voice like let's say your yours or mine. Definitely, you know that is I always my description is the 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 416 is sharper and it, it, it's yeah. sharper and brighter and. For a lot of things, it's ideal for what I want to do. But you wouldn't say if you're gonna if you're gonna do an audio book, you wouldn't necessarily say that's your best choice because it is a little more ear fatiguing. But that's I would say you know you don't have to do this setup, and a lot of people never need more than one microphone. I just like to be able to have that option because I've done different kinds of things like video game stuff. When they said, "Hey, we we want this one to match what we already got," here you go. I'm ready to go. Right. You like to be able um, to say yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, now Terry Briscoe's asking, what is that swing arm? I must know. <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've got a couple of those sitting around for, you know, displaying my ribbon mics and stuff. You can get those like at Guitar Center or on Amazon really easily. Right? Yeah. 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 This swing arm I got for $12 on Amazon. And it, you know, the arm in that comes with this booth is usually set for a single mic mount, but I wanted to be able to switch back and forth without doing any unplugging. And so I went and found this mic arm. And like I said, it was $12, went right in the same place where you would normally put one microphone. And I will even do this here. It's called a, real it's called quick. a T-bar. So if you're, yes, if you're yeah. searching, look for a mic T-bar. Or a stereo yep. bar or something yeah. like that. I mean, that. you can literally put three mics on that thing if you wanted to. Probably yeah. could, yeah. And it works as easily as uh, as that, go. right? <laughs> Just a simple switch, and there you have it. There you go. Now you can hear the difference between those two mics. It's, yep. it's kind of cool There's to hear the difference in, the, in that space. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, George, you got the question from J. Horace from Black. J. Hey, Jay. Um any quick pointers you can give an opera singer who wants to do voiceover? Do you do any coaching specifically for opera singers? So here's what I say. Opera singers have an advantage. And most singers have an advantage because you already know how to breathe. You already know how to take basically what I will call vague direction. Because you have been told you need to give different kinds of feelings, emotions, and all those sorts of things. So... You are coming in armed already. Any voiceover coach, I think, would be pleased to have somebody who already knows what it means to put emotion in their performance. And that, you can go to anyone. It doesn't necessarily have to be a specific one who's going to work from opera to voiceover. You are working with an advantage already. It doesn't mean that suddenly people are going to hire you faster, but it does mean that you are are going to be able to take direction better because you're used to it already. It's just applying it in a different space. So I, I don't know that there's any specific direction that you have to take or, or the specific coaching you have to get as, a, as someone coming from an operatic background into voiceover. You have to know to tamp down your projection. You can work on that and be able to take direction that seems not specific, right? You've been told to sound taller. <laughs> you already know what that feels like, 
right? And so you can work on that sort of thing without having to do a lot of processing because you, you know, most everybody, you know, knows that people don't know what they want until they hear it. Yeah. You're right. They're going to say, Oh, I need to, I need to hear this. Angela Brown. Do I know Angela Brown? I think we were in, uh, uh, we may have been in Porgy and Best together here in Charlotte some years ago. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it just take, it takes, it just takes you being open to direction and you have that going in. So I think that's, that's the positive nature for voiceover for people coming from music, particularly opera. You know what emotion is in your performance. Absolutely. There you go. Yeah. He, he had a second part that we went, went technical. Should we yes. talk about that? Go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, yeah it, was, it was about your Apollo and how you're mm-hmm. using it. I have to know Apollo he has is one. Are you using the Nick? Yeah, you're not using <laughs> any. Uh, no, no unison plugins. No, no C suite. Noise plugs, reduction. None of that. None of fancy that. stuff. Yeah, mine is mine is as is at the moment. And so again, my one of the things I wanted to do was learn how to use it better. See if there's any value to that for me. But thus far. I've had no complaints about the things that I've been able to produce. So, and I think Dan is very much a believer in microphone interface software, right? Yeah. Keep it simple. Keep it yeah, simple. Keep it simple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually had a question about Wovacon too, another one. And then Karen asked about the dates again, so we can mm-hmm. repeat the dates for Wovacon. But what, what does make that conference unique? I mean, I've been there, so I know, mm-hmm. obviously. But um, what does make it, what differentiates it from the other big conferences happening? So I, I think one of the main differentiators for us is we do have speakers. We will have spe- people come in and do keynotes and that sort of thing. But the individual things that are taught there are taught by the people who are members of WovoCon, of Wovo. Those people who are willing to share their knowledge in that setting and, and say, I have this, you need this. Here's what we're doing. Nobody's selling. Our own people are not selling to our members. They are sharing their knowledge freely and trying to give, and and we've heard this in every kind of conference, sharing those nuggets to say, here's some information for you to take back. We ask our membership, where, you know, do you have something you want to teach? Let us know. Tell us what you want to talk about. And we can put you on the roster of, of instructors. So that's what, that's what I think makes us a little bit different. We're not there to sell you any more than what <laughs> we've got coming in. This is for us to share. I mean, one of the things we do on the Sundays is we have the family meeting, right? We talk about the industry, where we're going as an organization, what we want to be doing in the coming years, and make everyone want to be a part of this and contribute to it so for the better, for the greater good of the industry and the organization. Yeah. And, 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 and that's the whole point is we are an industry association. This is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we're, we're not, as George was saying, we're not, we're not there trying to make money off of this because as George and I will tell you, we're not making any money off of it. We're no. doing this because <laughs> it's important to the industry. Uh, so that, and that's why we want people there it's because it's fun it's great to, you know, to meet your, 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 the other people in your community and, of course, exchange ideas and stuff. And a lot of that goes on in the lobby and out in the hallway. And, and that's what, what makes it such a fun conference and, uh, you know, because it's not commercial uh, the way a lot of these other ones. It's not like, you know, here's 10 agents who are going to tell you how to do this stuff. No, here's a bunch of other voice actors in our organization who tell you how they do things, sort of like what we're talking about right now. And that's not to say we don't have agents involved, right? We do right. have some, some agents involved with us, but we're not, they're not there to sell. That's, I think that's the, the, um, the most important. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be May 3rd, 4th, May 5th? 4th, May 4th, 5th, and 6th. 4th, 5th, 6th, next year. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to celebrate May the 4th be with you. Yes. And Cinco de Mayo that same weekend. Talk about a party. And Bring your lightsabers. Birthday, my birthday, yes, and and his birthday. So. In Orlando, Florida. Let's make sure we understand where yes, we're going to be. Orlando, we're in Orlando. 
So can't wait yes. wait to uh, to do this. Um, now somebody's asking, wh- when will the demo be ready to use? B- demo player ready to use? I'm really excited about this, and I thank you for providing it. It's going to be ready probably this week. People have been testing it. We got all the bugs out of it. It's it's gonna it's definitely gonna be hitting the main the uh, the main road uh, this so, week. So we know what we're talking about. So oh. World Voices as one of our one of our uh, benefits for membership is we are providing a demo player that you can use on your website, and it is HTML5 based, as I believe is the word. It, it, in that it 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 plugs right in. It's just a bit of code. It you know adds your demos, and you can and they can be played back, um, and you don't have to invest in anything. And that's part of what we're doing to offer our membership as a, as a thing. And we're going to be improving it. As we as we go, we've actually talked about here are the few the features we'd like in the future. Absolutely. Well, George, it's always just a pleasure to talk to you, no matter what. But thank you so much for being with us on our show today, and uh, we really appreciate uh, all of your knowledge. And we look forward to having you on again real soon. If people well, want to get a hold you, of you, where do they go? I am at voevolution.com that is my website to be rebuilt soon but voevolution.com is where you can find me you don't need to rebuild it it works great it's one of the best websites <laughs> i've seen anyway george washington the third thanks for being with us thank you all right see you george all right we will be right back and get ready to wrap it up and re-rack it for tech talk right after these messages yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. Voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. It's time to thank Source Elements because they are still supporting VOBS after all these years, at least five or more. And uh, at this point, um, boy, you know what Source Connect is, right? <laughs> yes, you probably do, right? You've been watching the show, you've been listening to others in the voiceover community talk about it, and there's no doubt that it's well loved. In fact, some minor proof of how much people appreciate Source Connect and Source Elements is they just won an award. They just won an award at, at uh, one voice conference and got best uh, service provider for the voiceover industry, um, which is amazing. It was weird because I was in the same category. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I'm honored to have lost to Source Elements, you know, because these guys are the real deal. And they've been, they've been serving audio industry and voiceover industry specifically for as long as I have, if not longer. Um, they've been, they've been there really since the beginning almost of the home studio revolution, honestly. Anyway, I won't go on. You guys know who they are. Go, if you haven't needed it yet, then you probably have your demo license already. If you don't go over to source-elements.com and get your, your demo and start playing with it, start getting used to how it works and learning why it's what producers really prefer to use in voiceover productions. We'll be right back right after this. You're still watching VLBS? <laughs> Apparently you are. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're going to re-rack it for Tech Talk here in just a minute. So uh, if you've got questions about home voiceover studio tech, which I know you, that's one of the reasons you guys come here, uh, throw those in the chat room as well. If you got a problem or a question or something along those lines, we will get to that in the next hour. Uh, anyway, uh, so next week, 
It'll be Tech Talk number 85. Or if you're staying live, like you should, you'll be able to play along with us here. Uh, let's see here. What else we got going on here? You've got a, an audio, you've got a, a webinar for Twisted Wave coming up. Yeah, this time I'm doing audiobooks. So I've taught Twisted Wave for just sort of general beginners, more advanced, and now audiobooks because, well, anybody who knows it records audiobooks. There's a lot of minutia and a lot of organization and workflow to be really efficient. So I'll be teaching that. You can sign up for that at George the dot tech slash webinars. And while you're there, right underneath the big banner or the picture of me on it and stuff, right below there's a raffle copter. What the heck is that? You can sign up and be entered to win a free uh, webinar pass to whatever webinar that you want. Um, you just follow the prompts on there and you can share it with your followers. And uh, that's how it works. The more you share, the more tickets you get, essentially. So uh, check it out. Cool. Um, thanks for listening. Yeah. Uh, we've got our donors of the week, large pile of them, starting with you know, 949 Designs. That's our good friend, Lee Penny. That is. <laughs> Jonathan Grant. Casey Clack. Christopher Epperson. Sarah Borges. Philip Sapir. Tom Pinto. Shelly Avellino. Brian Page. Patty Gibbons. Rob Ryder. Greg Thomas. A Doctor Voice. Antland Productions, Uncle Roy. Shana Pennington Baird. Martha Kahn. Don Griffith. Trey Mosley. Diana Birdsall. And Sandra, Sandra Manweller. Man Close enough. That Take was actually the same almost time in makes sync. it harder. <laughs> it does. <laughs> hey, make sure you join our mailing list too. Go to our website, vobs.tv, and click on sign up for subscribe to our newsletter because that way you'll know who our guest is going to be this week, which is really cool. Uh, we also need to thank our amazing sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials, VoiceOver Extra, Source Elements, VOHeroes.com, VoiceActorWebsites.com. JMC Demos, and WorldVoices.org, the Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. Join today. Uh, thanks to Jeff Holman for his work in the chat room tonight and uh, in Facebook and in uh, YouTube Live, YouTube. and Sue Merlino for getting it done from wherever it is that she is, probably in, in her, her lair. <laughs> in her lair. And Lee Penny for just being Lee Penny and for donating to our show. We really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, stay tuned now for Tech Talk, and uh, we're going to rack, rack that up right now. But, you know, it, this is not an easy business, and that's why we bring you all of these really cool people that know the business inside out, backwards, and upside down and give you the opportunity to learn from them, and that's important. But when it comes to your audio, hey, if it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. See you in a sec. Don't